Welcome to the Smart Dating Academy podcast. I'm Bella Gandhi, the founder of Smart Dating Academy and your host. I started Smart Dating Academy in 2009 because I had this crazy knack of giving people dating advice that actually worked, that I took. I've been married for almost 25 years, and now my company helps people to date smarter and to find love. This podcast is meant to bring more love into your life, no matter where you are and what you do. And we're here to bring more life into your love. Smart daters, welcome back to this week's episode. And because you ask for them, we deliver. You love the love stories. And this love story of Marilyn Dollar is one of my favorites because Marilyn is not only a client that Lindsay and I both, of course, fell in love with, because once you hear Marilyn, you'll realize why everybody falls in love with Marilyn. It's called like the Marilyn effect. But Marilyn also um, is just an amazing human being, and she's become a dear friend. And I will spoiler alert this. I went to her engagement party, but I'm not going to skip ahead. I'm going to introduce you. I'm going to have you meet Marilyn. I'm going to have you hear the beauty of this soulful person who has transformed her life like something I cannot even describe to you. You just have to hear it for yourself. Marilyn, thank you for joining us. Oh, Bella, that's such a great introduction. Thanks for having me. Oh my gosh, you are like just you and I were noodling. Like, we're just going to do ourselves and have this chat and tell you this organic story of you. So, kind of tell us a little bit about you, you know, kind of, and we'll go from there. Maybe like tell us what you, you know, what you do for work and how you grew up. And we're just going to go from like little Maryland to big Maryland. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see, what do I do? So when I first started dating my husband, I told him I work at a candy company and he said, which one? And I said, well, I can't tell you that you might be a stalker. I don't know. And he goes, well, if you work at Milky way, you might be my girlfriend. (laughs) 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 That's his favorite candy. And zip. I said nothing for like months. Cause you know, I mean, we've all dated those weird stalker people. I did not need someone. I had not even been at my job for very long, maybe a few years. And I didn't want some random guys showing up. So it was months before I told him I did work at Milky Way. <laughs> so you are working at a candy company and we're going to come back to the growth in your career that happened along with all of your growth. So tell us like you grew up in the South, right? I did. So originally I'm from Memphis, Tennessee. Um, I've got family in Nashville, Memphis, Mississippi, Louisiana, and my dad was in the Navy. So I grew up a Navy brat. So we, while we spent a few years down South, By the time I was in second grade, we had moved overseas and I didn't come back until just before high school. Oh, wow. Okay. And then, and then what happened? Tell us about your, tell us about your dating life, Marilyn Dollar. (laughs) I mean, look, even when I first came to you, I said, dating is not the problem. I get plenty of dates. It's, they're not good husband quality. (laughs) Oh, we have her brainwashed GHQ. Do you hear that? So, and you, so, right. Okay. So you dated, you were married. What was your first marriage? How old were you and how did that happen? (laughs) As she groans in the background. Uh, I don't like to talk about that one. Well, let's see. I was 17. Okay. I, I was, you know, we moved from the Azores back to the States to Texas, which is in its own right, a foreign country for real. And it was very Bible belt, And, you know, you don't sleep around, you don't date around, you meet someone at church and you get married. And so that's kind of what I did. I met somebody at church. I got married. Turns out he was a real, you can say it. Yeah. He was just a, 
not had good husband quality material. Mm. And we moved to Great Falls, Montana from Houston, Texas. And it was just, it was a really dark time in my life. I was away from all my family, all my friends. I had had a lot of loss in my life at that time. My best friend from within my senior year of high school, my best friend from junior high was killed in a car accident. My, my, another guy that I was dating in high school was killed in a car accident with my best friend. Oh, my, um, freshman year of college, I just started college and I was in a sorority and my sorority sister and I did everything together. She committed suicide. And I was just like, I'm out of here. This other guy that I had been seeing on and off, right. He proposed and he had this little promise. Oh, if we're married, uncle Sam, we'll pay for your way. And we'll go back to the Azores. I'm like, he painted this whole picture and I bought into it. But, you know, the reality was he got shipped out to Great Falls, Montana. There were six feet of snow. They didn't use salt. He took my car. I couldn't drive. And he was super abusive. And I thought I was going crazy. Turns out he was just gaslighting me. Oh. And it took me about three months to kind of realize this was a pattern. This isn't some one off, you know, he would an abusive situation with a guy like that looks like this. He comes home. Everything's great. He makes up some story, knocks me around and then pretends later, like nothing ever happened or says, I don't know what came over me. That'll never happen again. This just continued to happen over and over. And I thought, I, I got to get out of here. But he was so controlling and oppressive. There was really no way for me to get out. So finally, uh, I think it was New Year's Eve. I had gotten fired from my job because I was late all the time. I was in and out of the hospital with bruises, contusions, head injuries, broken oh ribs. I mean, horrible. But I was so young. I, I didn't know. I, I just, I didn't know what to do. I didn't have any resources And, um, I knew when I told him that I got fired, that he was going to do something terrible. I just could feel it. And sure enough, he did. And I remember having this kind of out of body experience. And, um, I thought, you know, this is not the way I go. I have so much I want to give to the world. I'm 18 at this point. Sorry, this got really dark all of a sudden. (laughs) You're 18. I was 18. Oh, man. And I thought, I, I, uh, I got to do something. And so I, we had this big fight and I was a mess. He broke my nose and my jaw and it was terrible. Somehow I convinced him to go get us some alcohol for New Year's Eve. And I called my dad. And I said, I'm leaving. And he said, don't leave until I get there. And I said, I don't know that I'll make it till the morning. And he said, I'll be there in the morning. And he was, and he did come and get me and my cat. And we drove the long way home. Oh my God. It was terrible from great falls, Montana in January down to Houston, Texas. Oh my God. And he was just, you know, no judgment telling me you know, what my future was, is going to be bright. And I, this was going to pass. And it was just, it was a terrible time, but it, it really showed me how much my dad cared for me. And, uh, and after that, I mean, probably solid 10 years, I just, I was anti dating, anti men. I said, never get married again, forget about it. And then I met another guy at work and I thought, well, I'm meeting him at work. We're both smart. It, you know, it's fine. Um, and so I, I married him and we had two wonderful kids, which I loved. I stayed home for 10 years with them and all through this. So I had a lot of therapy after that first marriage. I did a lot of volunteering at women's shelters to just understand it wasn't anything I did or somehow my fault. It was a circumstantial piece of my life. And many women struggle to get out of that pattern. 
and grateful that I was able to have the support around me to get out of that. So falling into another relationship, I thought would never happen again. And it didn't in that same way, but there are a lot of different ways that men or anyone in a relationship, if they're controlling, can hold you back. Yeah. And, and so in that second marriage, now I have kids. Now I'm a stay-at-home mom. So it's another form of control, if you will. We didn't share bank accounts. Sure. He, he went to work. I stayed home. I'm like, where am I going to get the money? I still had to pay for groceries and all the things the kids wanted to do. So summer camp and football and baseball and all the things. And so it's funny, full circle. Many times there was a woman who worked at the candy company I work for now. And she was in charge of taste testing, which one of my girlfriends had told me about. And I would call her up and I would say, Lee, I need to go to the Aldi this week. Can I come in and chew some gum? And she would say, every time come in and at 30 minutes, I would choose some gum and I would get a check and I would go buy groceries. And when I started working there years later, she said, you have transformed so much. It has been so wonderful to watch. I'm so happy for you. So you never know where you're going to be years later, who I never would have a million years thought I'd be working there as I am now. So When uh, I was married and staying at home with these kids and my husband had this great job and he came home and said, yeah, I, I don't think I want to be married anymore. I'm like, wait, what? I was not expecting that. Right out of nowhere. Out of nowhere. And turned out he had been having an emotional affair with someone at his work, which is very common, but he did not really want to work on it. And I I remember thinking to myself, how, how am I going to do this? And my friends helped me with some vision board exercises. And, and we just, we just got together and talked about it. Like, what are the situations? What are the scenarios? My one girlfriend, who's a CFO said, let's draw out three financial scenarios and see what, what you could do, right? You could stay at home, continue to do your stamping up business, maybe take on a part-time business but you won't be able to keep the house. You could go to work full time, but then you have to pay for childcare. You could go to work full time and keep your stamping up business, but you won't have any personal life. And so I had these situations, but he said, oh, you'll never leave me. You don't even have a job. Well, (laughs) challenge accepted. Challenge accepted. But wait, he wanted the divorce, but he- he, Changed his mind. He changed his mind then. Okay. So he has this emotional affair. You lay out the scenarios, but he's like, I don't want to work on it, but wait, I don't want a divorce. So basically just accept me having this affair and let's stay together. Isn't that great? Heads I win, tails you lose. Not in a million years. No, not doing it. Bye boy. But controlling, right? And this is their mindset, the narcissist. 100%. And I didn't know. I I was just like, okay, my girlfriends are telling me that I should just leave. So what can I do? And so that's, that's what I did. And I said, um, I got to get a job. How am I going to get a job? And my girlfriends, we were just talking about this the other day said, um, well, who do you know that works? And I said, "I, I don't know anyone who works. All my girlfriends are stay at home moms. We all have you know, these little businesses that we have, but it's not enough to pay a mortgage. And they said, well, um, who did you used to know when you used to work? And I thought, oh my God, I've been out of work for 10 years. Well, I used to know this girl, Carol, and we still get back together, you know, for lunch every Christmas. All right, we'll call Carol. And Carol and I started at Quaker Oats back in the day. And she was so fun. And I was there when Pepsi bought us. So I worked for Pepsi for a while. And, uh, and I said, well, Carol, let's get together for lunch. So we did. And I said, um, do you remember my old boss, Julia? And she goes, yeah, I think she's working at this candy company. <laughs> I said, oh, well, I should call her. What, or what's her email? And so 
I called her, I emailed her and she called me back. She goes, Oh my God, I was just thinking about you. How are you? And I said, well, Julia, I'm going through a divorce and you know, it's messy. She said, come in and let's have lunch. So we came in, I came in, we had lunch and she said, I got some projects. Would you consider working on them? I said, I can only work 10 to two because my kids are in school. I mean, I was, I had such a little mindset back then. And I said, um, could you, could you work that out? She goes, yeah, absolutely. And so three weeks into that, somehow like there's a 21 day rule with me. I don't know what it is, except for the 30, 30, 90 day rule that that's still a thing. That's my rule. I know. And I, I agree and adhere to that. (laughs) Very important. And I, um, at the end of three weeks, she came up to me and said, if we could find enough work for you to work full time, would you consider that on a temp basis through Christmas? And I said, sure, I'll figure it out. And I did, I got my kids in after school care. I got them to be able to ride the bus to school. Uh, I got a girlfriend of mine to help me out and I transitioned full time. And while they were in at their grandmother's house for Thanksgiving, I moved out of my house. Oh, and wow. I got an apartment. Okay. And I had no furniture. I took their clothes and the stuff from the bathroom and that was it. And all my girlfriends, I mean, it was like these graduation parties that you saw during COVID where people were just driving around the block. My girlfriends were just coming and dropping stuff off. My one girlfriend gave me a table that had been in her garage, uh, a couple of beds for the kids. I mean, my whole apartment was furnished by my friends and the kids came home on Thanksgiving and I picked them up and we walked in the back door and then we walked out the front door and got in my car and drove to the apartment. Oh my God. So scary. So I had been at work three weeks. I had an apartment. The kids were doing fine. I was still doing my stamping business, still working full time. And I started traveling a lot for work. And I thought, I can't do the stamping business and try to date and try to be at all the kids' football games and be the football mom and all that. Something's got to give. So I gave up my stamping business that I had done for 12 years, a lot of friends. And those are like stamps on cards, right? Like, yeah, like, uh, yeah, I don't have one in front of me, but we still will send cards to each other, right. That we've, we've done. You sent me one, but we'll get to that. Yeah. 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 Uh, and we still, well, it's just a creative outlet for us. And I said, uh, I got to make some room in my life for dating. And, uh, when I did that, I was dating this really interesting guy that I had met on Tinder and it was a great year. It was, I'll call it the gap year (laughs) of spending a lot of time either in the bedroom or at the Home Depot. He was very handy. (laughs) Wait, say that again for the people in the back. We spent time in the bedroom or Home Depot. That was that was your foray back back into the dating world again. This is pre smart yes. dating academy. People, don't get yourself all excited right now. And you know he 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 had a lot of expertise in many areas, and I was very happy for that year. But every time that I would bring up to him, hey, the exclusive conversation or. When can I meet your mom who just lives like a couple of suburbs over? He was always like avoiding that. And he hung out at my house mostly. And just the whole thing seemed kind of shady. Uh, But he was a great guy. He was a Polish guy, really big, strong. um, But he, he just, he was not a family guy. He wasn't into my kids. He only came over when they weren't there. I mean, it was just, you could tell this was not going anywhere. So I said, oh, okay, well, you know, let's, uh, I'm going to go, I've got this trip. I'm going to Istanbul and, you know, really miss you and, you know, all the things. So I get to Istanbul and uh, I had become friends with a a couple of people that I had been working on the meeting with for quite a long time. And so we hung out and just had a great time. 
and I tried to call the Polish guy like every day. He didn't, didn't pick up the phone. I thought, well, it's the time difference, like all the things. And you're calling him from Europe. Oh yeah. I'm calling him from, from Turkey. You're paying Rome charges. I know it's terrible. I was so, it was dumb. And uh, finally it was a long trip back on the airplane. And I thought, you know, why am I doing this? I just had this great international meeting that I put together for a hundred people coming in from all over the world. I organized the whole thing. It was amazing. And yet this guy is treating me like, I don't even know, not the way I should be treated. I, there's just something wrong. And I got off that airplane and I called him from the taxi and I said, you know, I just don't think this is working out. And then the next call was, I called you and I said, okay, I think I'm ready. <laughs> what do we need to do? <laughs> now, if now correct me, if my memory is wrong, you, the, at that moment you did call, but you and I had met as you reminded me at mm -hmm. an event at the Chicago Tribune. At the trip, yeah. At the trip years, with either years. me and we Jen Weigel or yes. Heidi Stevens, but yes. one of the journalists from the Tribune or Amy Dickinson, I think it was Ask it was Amy, Amy, right? That's right. It was the advice, the national advice columnist, Ask Amy, we were doing an event together. And I think Jen or Heidi, somebody was moderating it, but you were in the audience at the Tribune Tower and we talked for a minute and then I think we kept in touch via Facebook. Yep. And you had sent me one of those cute little stamp cards. I remember I still have it in my <laughs> closet because I, I never throw away notes that people give me. So I'm I'm funny like that. Words of affirmation are, are great. So then Marilyn sends me a message and says, I think I'm ready. And I think the message probably came on Facebook. <laughs> yep. Messenger. I'm ready to do this. I was like, are you sure? Because yep. I thought you were ready a few times. You're like, no, no, no. Yep. Now I'm really ready. And then... Let me tell you guys, when Marilyn says she's ready, <laughs> she's ready. So, so now you engage with us and you go through our process and you fill out our documents and we meet you at the four seasons. Yep. And, and so I'm giving you my impressionistic memory. So now you show up there and you're sparkling as you can all hear her personality. And she showed up and she had this kind of chin length, kind of curly hair and these glasses on and this outfit that was just kind of, you know, whatever. She's like, I just, you know, we were talking about style and the importance of how you look on the outside and how that's going to make you feel on the inside. And she said, do you think I should have my hair curly or straight? And I just remember going, well, where do you feel prettier? She's like, oh, when my hair's straight. So now we have this conversation. We have this conversation with lots of people, right? About, you know, what are the things you can do to make yourself really feel good in dating? So we have this meeting, three hours, we onboard her. We're like, she's great. She's going to do well. So a week later, I was keynoting a match.com singles event for women and presenting like how to find the perfect guy. Mm -hmm. And I go through this whole, and Andy, my husband came <laughs> to help me set up because I am, do you think I can set up a projector? Come on. Like, no, that's out of Bella Gandhi's skill set, right? Like I can speak, I can make the audience laugh, but don't make me put the projector. So, so at, so I finish up my talk and this woman's like, oh my gosh, that was great. You know, is that guy your IT guy? And I said, <laughs> well, that IT guy is my husband who is in finance and private equity, but he's a great guy. <laughs> and so she's, and she's talking to me as if we know each other. And I was like, oh, have we met? <laughs> and guess who it was? Dear listener, it was Marilyn Dollar. Marilyn had changed her appearance. Literally, was it even a week? Mm -mm. Like, I'm not exaggerating. Like a few days. It was a few days. So yeah. Marilyn decided that she was going to drink up the information <laughs> that we talked about and execute in like this rapid fire way. New look. She had her hair 
that was curly and, you know, puffy. And I can say that because I'm a curly, puffy haired girl too, naturally. And that's how we talked about the keratin. Marilyn went out, got her hair straightened. It was so dramatically different <laughs> that I didn't even recognize my own client, her outfit. She looked chic, her hair. I was like, Marilyn, she's like, remember we met last week? Like I'm your client. I was, I was rendered speechless at that point. And I'm sure you remember this moment as well. So what a compliment and what a testament to you where you just were like, okay, girl, you want me to do what? And then I'm going to do this too. Unrecognizable. And how did you feel? Uh, and so it was funny because you had said, well, something like, can a guy run his fingers through your hair? And I'm like, no, like never, I can't even get a brush. No. Okay. <laughs> then you've got to, you've got to do something with that. And I just felt, you know, I don't want someone to judge me by how I look. I want someone to judge me. Well, first, I don't want anybody to judge me. I, I just want to show up like I am. And I want everyone to have a good time. And be happy. But what I recognized was not everyone has that same filter, right. especially guys. Right. And while I said before, I had no problem getting dates. That was never the problem. It was getting dates with guys who saw immediately that I had value. Yeah. Yeah. And so overnight, it made me feel like people took me more seriously. They recognized that I was smart and I felt like they saw immediately that I had value. Mm -hmm. And that was a huge shift for me. I, I always knew that I had had that, but the first two failed relationships that I had that I, that was evidence I couldn't deny. Mm, and I, I never that. wanted to repeat that again. No, no. And I, and I remember doing this video exercise with you and we talked about softening up body language and how you present with good energy. And it's good to make people feel accepted and warm. And you, I just remember how you lit up the camera when we had you do it with a smile on your face. And it's like the whole world started to change for you and started to change like, whoop, like suddenly, <laughs> right. Dating changed, work dating changed. Change. Tell work us change. about everything. Like you did your photo shoot with this new look. <laughs> and literally, if I say to you guys, Marilyn broke the internet. I mean, oh. what kind of response did you get from those photos that we took? Oh my God, Bella, it, that was crazy. Uh, and I tell my girlfriends this overnight, my matches went from a lot of city workers and I have no problem with city workers. I believe in a hard work ethic and people who work um, with that feeling of what they're doing is important. And I work in corporate America. I've always wanted someone else that understood what that was like. I wanted someone who worked in corporate America. This is not a hard thing to ask for. Overnight, I went from a, a, a guy that I had gone out with in the last week was a pipe fitter. Another guy I went out with a week before worked at a steel mill. Another guy was a machinist and another guy was an auto mechanic. I could not make this up. Once AJ did that photo shoot and you and Lindsay helped me rewrite my copy just a little bit. It went from that to, I had a date with an attorney who had his own practice, a doctor who worked at Northwestern, a um, banker, <laughs> uh, and a, a guy who worked downtown. I mean, it, it was immediate and it wasn't just like these three, it was three pages 
of oh, guys, people. pages. Amazing. Amazing. I just, it was super overwhelming. And you had said I had been on match for a while. And then I had dated this guy who went full court press on me and that didn't work out. So when I came back and hit the reset button, you suggested that I try eHarmony. And that's even more intense because you got to fill out all this, these questions, like it's 128 questions or something. And it was just miraculous at the kind of quality of people that started showing up and they would write these really lovely emails to me. And it was amazing Uh, overnight. uh, Although I will say uh, one guy (laughs) asked me if I was a professional <laughs> a professional what he said your pictures are just a little too good to be true what are you really doing and I'm like no those are those are really the pictures they're not touched up or anything that's the way they look he goes uh take a picture with your camera which I did I just took a selfie and he goes oh all right well uh what are you doing this Friday <laughs> Right. This is not the man she ended up marrying, by the way. It was very fun. And and so we had lots of dates, all different kinds. Like Marilyn said, there's no slight on city workers and she dated plenty of those, but her manifestation now that she had become more successful in the corporate world was I want to date more white collar guys that can understand the world that I live in. And so now We started to date lots of these guys. Our big mission was to make sure that Mare fixed her picker and did not gravitate back to somebody who was narcissistic, avoidant, red flaggy. And you know that there, even though you know some the information about what a narcissist is you know you might be in therapy right you're doing your work but the gravitational pull towards what is familiar which could be dysfunctional red flaggy edgy it's a high pull right oh yeah yeah because it's it's what you know and narcissists tend to gravitate towards helpers nurturers women who are, um, helpful, right. Because they, they feel like, oh, well, this is, this is my world. This is what I deserve all the time without reciprocity. Oh, it will. I call narcissists or takers and a taker needs a giver, right? All the time. And givers like to give, until you realize you're putting sunlight into a black hole and nothing's going to come out of it. We can't just give and give and give and give and give, even though we're a giver because we're human and we need to get something back. Right. And that's where narcissists don't do so well. Cause they're like, well, wait, you can never give enough to a narcissist. Never. It's a pot with a huge hole. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So, so if we go back now in time, so we dated all kinds, we had some green flag guys, we had some red flag guys. Oh, did we have some red flag guys? Right. So we could toss those. If you could see our faces right now, we're laughing because there's some real doozers that came into your funnel. Right. And nobody would have known it, but we gave them all time and time weeds out all the kooks. You guys crazy cannot hide for that. That long. So if you give someone enough time, they're going to show they're crazy. Right. And we got rid of a lot of crazy, but then there was that one special email that came through. Now tell us about, tell us about, uh, tell us about this guy that, uh, <laughs> that asked you out on a date named Jim. So Jim was, um, you know, he looked like a pretty laid back. So I was dating these crazy guys. It's true. And then you had said to me, Hey, what if we expanded the age bracket? Because I, I wanted to date men in the city who were my age or younger. That was my, that was my, my bubble. And you said, well, what if we set the range like 50 to hundred miles away? I'm like, I, I don't want some suburban guy. And you're like, well, let's just try it. I'm like, all right, okay, I'm coachable. I'm going to do, okay, I'm doing what she says. It's worked <laughs> so far. So I spread that. 
And then you said, and let's go equidistant 10 years younger to 10 years older. I'm like 10 years older. My God, they're going to be retiring. And you're like, let's just see what happens. So I opened the aperture on that. And within, I'd say a week. So this is mm, roughly May-ish. And I had reset, I had reset in, I think, February. And uh, this guy sent me this email within a couple of days after this. And it was like paragraphs, like nobody speaks in paragraphs. You might get a sentence or two and usually very inappropriate with crappy spelling. (laughs) And this guy said, I loved your profile. You seem like a lot of fun. Uh, Tell me a little bit more about, you know, your kids or whatever I had talked about. I, I remember there was a part of my, I was into running. I did a a 5k every month. And I I remember putting in my profile, I love to run during the week and then wreck it on the weekend with pizza, which I still do. I love Lou Malnati's big fan. Mm. And so I said, uh, yeah, I'm running in a 5k this weekend, blah, blah, blah. And then the next day he sent me another email. Oh, tell me about this 5k. What made you decide to do this? And I don't even remember which one it was now. And I think it was the Ravenswood. And I said, well, I used to live there when I first moved to Chicago, you know, and we're just having this wonderful conversation. And about a week into it, he said, well, you know, these conversations have been great. And I found myself looking forward to coming home from work, putting the kids to bed, getting in the tub and then reading his email. Like that was my daily, I hope this guy emailed me back because they were just so great. And he said, I would love to meet you in person and get off this website. Well, I mean, how many guys say that? Oh, my free time is expiring. So I thought, oh, is he another one of those guys? And I'm like, well, (laughs) let's talk on the phone. So we talked on the phone and he asked me out and uh, he asked me out for Friday night. And I said, Friday night, really? And I remember reading in the book, uh, he's just not that into you. If he doesn't ask you out on a weekend night, he's not that serious. And I thought, Oh, Friday night, this is Friday night. He's given me his Friday night. I can't believe it. So we, uh, we were going to meet at a little restaurant close to where I live. So in case I had to run home, I could. So we were going to meet there and I, I was so nervous. Of course I was running late, but I did make it in. And he had this beautiful dozen red roses. He was sitting at the bar. We had a glass of wine. He goes, I, I, and we're, there's only one table in the restaurant that's empty. And it's the table he had reserved for dinner, but I didn't want to commit to dinner. So we were just sitting at the bar drinking a glass of wine. So after this glass of wine, he gives me the roses. He says, well, this is our table. If you would like to stay for dinner. And I'm like, yeah, okay. I'll, I'll stay for dinner. (laughs) And why not? I thought, you know, this guy seems he's nice. I, I, I could really, we could talk about anything for like a long time. And I kept thinking, oh, I can't make this date too long. It's going to, it's going on too long. I I should. Okay. Okay. Dinner. That's let's separate. So we had, we had a lovely dinner and then he asked me out for dessert and drinks somewhere else. Like, let's go listen to some country music. I'm like, okay. So we went and did that. And, uh, and I thought this is going really well. And then before the end of the night, I find out his hobby is screenwriting. He loves to write plays and TV shows and movies. No wonder he's such a great writer and he's a bit of an introvert. I mean, it was just so fun. And before the end of the night, he asked me out on another date for the next weekend. And from then on, he closed me every date for the following weekend and still, still does that still to this day. And we've been dating now and we've been married. (laughs) (laughs) That tells you how happy it is. If you feel like you're still dating when you're married, that's pretty freaking amazing. (laughs) So married almost two years dating seven. Mm, 
I love that. And, and I know that, and I, I, j- close the loop on this. What's the age difference between you guys? Is Jim younger than you? No, he's older. He's older. <laughs> he's six years older. So oh. within that 10 years that you had, you had said, mm-hmm. but he, you would never know it by the things that we do. 100%. And I can attest to this because as a very hands-on roll my sleeves up dating coach, as you all know, we're, I'm in it with you. Lindsay's (laughs) in it. Eileen's in it. So when Marilyn and Jim were fairly like they were definitely committed. We knew he was high GHQ. They were boyfriend, girlfriend. It was all good. Andy and I met them for dinner. (laughs) Cause I had to kick the tires on who's going to get my Marilyn, right? Like, all right. And I'm looking at her during the dinner. I was like, this is a keeper. (laughs) This is a keeper. And we still have that picture of the four of us from that dinner at summer house where just a nice guy, good looking, smart, self-effacing, funny. He's tall. tall. (laughs) He's tall. He's tall for sure. Right. So what she gave up in age, she got in height. (laughs) Right. I will always remember when we met at the four seasons, writing out that list, because everyone, we all have a list of our guy, right. And over six feet was a must, must have. Yeah. And I'm five, three. I mean, you and I are about the same. And you had said, wait, wait, you really, you want someone over six foot? I mean, is that a deal breaker? And I'm like, Oh yeah. I I gotta have a tall guy. Gotta have a tall guy. And you're like, well, you know, they all come in different packages. Right. I mean, I was willing to give it up, but I'm glad I didn't have to. (laughs) You didn't have to, but she was very flexible on that. I always say everybody's the same height lying down. If you know what I mean. That's right. That's right. Right. So, so, but she got the height, gave a little in age and, and what's so funny, and I was telling Marilyn, like what sparked me to have Mayor on the podcast was a couple of months ago, you might remember Sugar on the podcast who talked about finding love and Sugar, if you haven't heard that podcast, go back and listen to how Sugar found love. She's a twin and found love with the twin, but Sugar said, Bella, you had an Instagram live sometime last year with this woman who talked about how she didn't want to date someone older, but you convinced her to broaden her age parameters. And then she met this guy and he brought her roses. So I thought to myself, okay, I can expand my distance. And that's when she met the love of her life who ended up being outside of the 50 miles. He was from Milwaukee. And so that sparked me. I was like, well, if Marilyn's story sparked sugar and you're both our clients, then Marilyn needs to come tell her story. So Jim and Marilyn are two peas in a pod. Can't imagine. I, it's like, I can't imagine you guys with anybody else. No, it's the same. No. And we- we have so much fun together. There's, and still we talk all the time. Once a month, we go and see my mom in Mississippi and we drive and it's about on a good day. It's a 13 hour drive on a not so good day. It's 15 to 16 hours. Many times, Bella, we don't even turn the radio on. We're just talking about our business. We're talking about our work. We're talking about what do we want to do as a couple? We're doing a couple's retreat next year. I'm super excited with another, my best friend and her husband. And she has even said, you know, seeing you with Jim, this is my best friend of since college has really changed my marriage with my husband. Oh, I have goosebumps. So I love that. You know, you just, you keep paying it forward, paying it backwards, spreading that energy to as many people as you can. You you don't think, you know, your best friend needs your help, but then we do things with them all the time. They're coming to stay with us in Key West in a few weeks. I mean, we have a great time, but has fundamentally changed how her and her husband interact. And her husband says, 
I'm so grateful you met Jim. He's so fun. And we have so much more fun now. So everybody loves Jim. They're like, uh, is Jim coming? <laughs> I'm like, wait, I'm coming. What does that count? What about Jim? Is he coming? Like all the guys, they want to hang out with Jim. Everybody so. loves Jim. Jim's like a guy's guy, yeah. but he's also sensitive and funny and committed to personal growth yes. and just super lovely. And I love that about the two of you. And I loved um, being invited to your engagement party and bringing you that gargantuan bottle of champagne. I just, (laughs) because it was such a monumental thing to me. Like you, it's like you found big love. So you needed big champagne. (laughs) It was awesome. We had a lot of champagne that night. And then being able to get married in Key West and share that with everyone virtually, right? We couldn't have very many people there, but we did do a live stream. I was there. And it was so fun. Yeah. There was probably, I think we had 128 people online. On live. It was was amazing. It was amazing and beautiful. And I still have the photos in my camera. And maybe if I can get it together, we'll put a page up on about Marilyn on our website and (laughs) all the fun things she does. And she's a coach too. So she does, she's an, if you were going to have a life coach, I couldn't recommend anybody more highly Uh, than you because you're amazing. You're amazing. Listen, I am a huge believer in coaching, right? I mean, let's, spin back to what you said about how this had a ripple effect in my life. I remember sending you an email about the ROI. Yeah. Oh, talk about that. I forgot about that. Because I, you, back in the day, you're pretty smart chick when it comes to finance you, you've got a good solid background before you ever came to this. And I thought, I want to tell her because it took me a while to pull the trigger on this because I had to save up the money. I was a single mom. I was an admin. My ex-husband did not pay me any child support. Like I could have easily taken all the victim mindset and just poured it onto myself. And I was not going to do that. And so I remember when I, we got our bonus at work, I got my income tax return. I haven't gotten a refund since I got married. I just will tell you that is the one downfall. (laughs) But back then as the head of household and as a single mom, I did get a refund and I put all that together and I said, you know, I know I'm your friend, but I want to pay you like I would be a regular client. How much is it? And it was a lot. It was a lot to me at that time. And I, I remember writing those, those checks to you. I wrote you two checks and I thought, oh my God, am I, this is crazy, but I want to do this. I want to do it right. I want to do it right for myself. I want to do it right for my kids and I'm in a different place and I need this. And so I hired you and I I did the photo shoot and I straightened my hair and I, I met with a stylist, you know, I still use Annie Francis as my stylist. We will meet up twice a year. And she helps me put together a wardrobe for the season. She's amazing. And I started showing up differently at work. I went to a personal development conference through Brendan Burchard in LA. And I came back from that and I was on fire and you were coaching me and I was dating. And I started to have the confidence to ask for projects at work. You know, I don't know why I thought you just do the work you have. You don't ask for more than this. And I started just saying, Hey, you know, that thing on the list that we need to get done this year, I I think maybe I could take a crack at it. What do you, I don't know, maybe I'll try. And I started to see some success and I thought, what would it look like if I could get out of being an admin? What could I even do? And I thought, well, I could be a project manager. I started researching and I thought I'm going to, I, I'm good at projects. And so I, I started talking to people I worked with and I said, Hey, do you have any projects? You know, I, I don't even know how I got what I got until I found someone who said, you know, actually I do, we have this bottleneck in the system, in the packaging system, and we don't know 
why it's taking so long, but we keep missing the deadline for packaging. I'm like, well, okay, uh, let me go try to figure it out. And I remember printing out this huge, look like uh, two giant tables was this long printed artwork wow. process of all the steps and the gates that you had to go through. And you know what? I identified the three bottlenecks and it was human error transposing the UPC code. And she said, uh, you want a job? I'm like, really? And I, I mean, it was probably within six months that you and I started working together. Yeah. And it was almost twice what I had been making. I, I mean, it was a significant increase. And I remember sending you a note saying, this is what I paid you. And now this is what I made. And I think this is the ROI that, that this has impacted my life so much. What I spent on coaching rippled out through everything. My kids were doing better. I was doing better. I loved what I was doing. I loved the people I was working with. I loved the projects I was working with. I loved that I was bringing my best self that I was learning and developing. And now I was starting to make more money. So I wasn't quite paycheck to paycheck. I wasn't having to do side hustles so much. And, and it was a huge breakthrough for me to just have one person. You just believed that there was a lid for every pot, that you were psychotically optimistic, and that you said, I believe in you and I think you can do it. Oh, I have goosebumps. And not only did you find the most amazing tall lid to your pot, <laughs> but how many, I remember that ROI email that you sent, how many job levels have you been promoted since we started together? So that was admin to project manager, one to senior project manager, two to global, global manager, three to now senior global manager, four. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. Well, that probably requires another large jug of champagne in and of itself <laughs> that we'll share at a certain point. So, yeah. um, so if you, if our dear listener out there is wondering could I ever find the lid to my pot? What would you tell them? I mean, first I would say, if you haven't found it yet, maybe your secret sauce is hiring a coach, mm. right? That's a, uh, that has a process. I mean, the one thing that I loved about working with you is you didn't just come at it and say, all right, you can do it. Let's go. You, you took the time to invest in me and to get to know me and to get to know what I wanted and what I was about. And then you assessed if you and I could work together because you don't work with just anyone. No. No. And then you said, here are, here are some red flags that I want you to watch out for on your picker. Mm. I, I didn't, no one had ever came to me with a plan like that. And you had it all, we're going to do this and we're going to do this and this is next. And this is what you're looking for. And I'm like, I'm in, I am all hundred percent in because I started to see results and I still go back to that. And even with my girlfriends, many of whom are still single and I've said, and you've met some of them at my engagement party, still single, beautiful, smart, very, very well-connected women, single. And mm -hmm. I think to myself, how much fun has it been? I mean, I love myself too. I love, I have a great time with myself. I have a great time with my girlfriends, but Jim just takes it to another level. Totally. So I, I would say find someone to believe in you. 
If you can't believe in this dream yourself, find someone who can hold that light for you until you can believe it yourself. Oh my God, that gave me goosebumps 100%. And it doesn't happen right away. It took years to find him. This didn't happen in minutes, did it? No. It didn't. And even in the beginning, you know, you and I talked about it at, right after the first date. I'm like, I don't know. I just, I didn't have those butterflies. I didn't have that feeling. And you, you just ignored all that. And you said, did he ask you out again? And I said, <laughs> well, yeah, he did. Okay. Did you say yes? Well, yeah. Okay. Well then next. <laughs> like, let's see. I hate butterflies. Butterflies are bad. It's anxiety I know. I know. in I your know. tummy telling you danger. Will Robinson get <laughs> out. Butterflies are bad. 100%. So the goal of the first date, if there's no red flags is to get to the second date. And the goal of the second date is with no red flags. Third. It's like to yeah. get to the third date. I mean, I know people probably you did the same. Like, I'm not even going to bother telling you about the fourth date because it was good. It was fine. And I know you're going to make me go out on the fifth date anyway. So, uh -huh. right. I'll be back in touch in a week. So I'm, I'm so delighted for you and the transformation of your life and for the amazing, whatever it was that, whether it was God or the universe that put us together in the same room at the Chicago Tribune event, <laughs> all the, all that time ago, even before Home Depot and the bedroom guy, right? So <laughs> yes. I'm just glad that his lack of response in Turkey and that long plane ride home where you're like, enough is enough. I want someone who, as you know, my philosophy, I want someone who likes you just a little bit more than you like them. And I think you have found yourself the perfect man. <laughs> Amen to that, sister. Marilyn, thank you for sharing your amazing story. I learned things about you today that I had never even heard. So I know you've inspired me. I don't know. I may need to go run a 5k right now after this <laughs> podcast because I'm go. so jacked up on, on good energy and two Pellegrino. So thank you for being here. And, um, we, I will see you in person soon and smart daters. I hope that you see yourself in Maryland, because I think when we all look inside, we can all see ourselves in Maryland and we've all done the things. Maybe we were 17 and 18, or maybe we were 28, or maybe we're now 58. But like she said, find someone that is going to believe in you and hold the light for you if you can't hold that light yourself. So with that, ping us. If you need help, we can be that light for you or ping somebody that can be the light for you. And until next week, I wish you all of the light and I'm holding that light for you, whether you can see it or not. Thank you for listening. See you next week.